This is for the fighters for change. Oppression would win if they were to give up. Our collective wellness depends on their tireless determination. And legalization slow burn wouldn't be smoldering without them. They break down stigmas, build up equity, and just say yes. Yes to good troublemaking. Yes to being empowered. Yes to fair access. Now more than ever, Weed Map says yes and stands with the fighters for change. Welcome to this conversation uh, on Green Enterprise, a partnership between my company, Digital Venture Partners, and Black Enterprise, where this week we're having a, a series of conversations with prominent Black uh, cannabis entrepreneurs and executives that I feel like are having um, great success and in creating inroads for more of us to come into the space and succeed. In this particular conversation, I have an NBA legend and his business partner slash son um, talking about the the events that they're making with their company, Isaiah International. So I'm super excited about this conversation. How are you guys doing today? We're doing well. We're a bit snowed in, but that's all right. <laughs> right. Oh, yeah, definitely. Everybody's dealing with some type of weather crisis right now. Crazy thing, Isaiah, before we even had this um this schedule, I've been watching a bunch of content about you the last couple of weeks, man, because you know how YouTube is in your head. And I love the show that you used to be on Open Court. So for like the past three weeks, I've been watching like all the old Open Court episodes and they're like, oh, you guys want to talk to Isaiah and Zeke Thomas? I'm like, yes. So it's a, it's a real honor to have a conversation with you today. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And those, those were fun. And we we always uh, had had a lot of fun doing them, as you can see. <laughs> right. Of course, and not to get too far off on a tangent, but I know like I feel like you got that show was the blueprint for like a lot of these artists. I mean, uh, athlete to athlete based like platforms and shows and podcasts. So I don't think people give y'all y'all flowers for showing that, you know, ex athletes can carry content themselves. Players only, baby. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so jumping in, I was doing some research about Isaiah International. Um, and you guys have been in business and been successful in various uh, industries and segments for, for years. I would love for you guys to give us kind of a backstory on how the company came together and why recently you identified cannabis as a great, uh, 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 a great industry to go into. Well, we started, um, you know, Isaiah International, the, the firm, I started it um, actually in, um, in 84. Um, and Magic and I uh, actually, um, he started Magic Enterprises. I started Isaiah International. Um, our first acquisition uh, was actually a radio station in Denver. Uh, we bought a radio station, then we invested in some real estate property together. And as the firm kept growing, um, you know, I, I, kept, I kept investing, kept moving into different spaces. And then I started becoming operational uh, within uh, the state of Michigan. And in the state of Michigan, um, uh, started in candy bars and, and uh, ice cream. And, and my econ teacher always told me to invest in things that you like, things that you're passionate about, candy and ice cream at that time. Mm -hmm. um, but, and then it moved into um, 1992, we purchased American Speedy Printing. Uh, it was ahead of a 700 print, print quick chains across the United States. I uh, was on the cover of Forbes magazine in 1992, was the first NBA player to be on the cover of Forbes magazine in Sports Illustrated. 94, retired, uh, bought, uh, was co-founder of the Toronto Raptors. And um, then after that, entered into the popcorn space, as again, things that I like. Um, so when you go into the store, you see that red bag of kettle corn and it says uh, Indiana popcorn. Uh, there was a company that I co-founded, so that then went into the uh, champagne space. And um, Joshua actually made the first trip over to France, uh, over to Champagne to meet the family, uh, negotiated, helped negotiate the deal, uh, put it together, uh, entered into the champagne space, and now we're in the cannabis space. But you know, the whole focus of Isaiah International is to uplift my family out of poverty. I was the first um, person of generational wealth. I mean, first person of wealth in my family. The goal is to leave generational generational wealth for, you know, my, my wife, nieces, nephews, you know, kids, and everybody else. And um, so, you'll see when you look on our website, you'll see a lot of my nieces and nephews, kids working in the business. And 
as part of their way of paying back their uh, student loans. Uh, they come into the business, they have to work, and you know that's that's how I got into the space. Uh, but Joshua can speak more about you know the, the cannabis space and and uh, why he found it so so interesting and why he introduced me to it uh, in a lot of ways. Okay, if, and sorry before you go into that, is you go by Zeke also, right? Yes. Cool. Cause okay, Camille intro he introduced us, and I was like, Joshua, he has been calling you Zeke this whole time. I'm like, okay, but yeah, go ahead, bro. I would love to hear about you know just you identifying this new emerging space where honestly it's not enough of us in, and kind of what was the catalyst for you to say, okay, this is something worthwhile for us to put our resources in. Definitely, um, the first four way foray of me working with uh, my father in heavy business capacity was, yes, as he said, Shroan Champagne. And that was an exciting experience, not only because it was champagne and branding and marketing, but also importing and exporting, you know, being an importer, learning how to bring a product from overseas into the United States um, and the struggles that come with that that's what I have applied to uh, my cannabis space. Um, cannabis to me was definitely a creative uh, space for me um, in terms of my usage, being a DJ, music producer, um, constantly in recording studios where THC consumption was going on. My sister, uh, she suffers from chronic pain, and she actually introduced me very first to the CBD, um, the other strains. And I got very interested, just very interested in how our people were separated from the plant um, in terms of prohibition, in terms of cotton, um, because, you know, as as many know, you know, the Civil War uniforms were made from hemp, uh, not cotton or uh, any other textile. So knowing the history of the plant um, as it grows, you know, in the Americas and Africa and around the world and how it can have such a great impact on carbon and climate change, um, it really piques my interest because I see in the cannabis industry kind of a microcosm of society, um, unlike sports and entertainment, which uh, we also specialize in. I see, you know, big corporations getting into the space and the farmers uh, kind of getting pushed out, much unlike the champagne space, which we got into and have been uh, successful in now for four years and definitely have some big announcements coming up and learning from this man in business uh, has been a pleasure and one that I took for granted definitely um, when I think of my dad I you know he's my dad he's just he's just dad you know he likes Ritz crackers and soup <laughs> but also, <laughs> you know, thinking about his background in business, um, the way that, you know, you know, when everybody thinks about, you know, him being president of a team, you know, that's running an entire organization. It's not just, you know, trade here and this there. Uh, there's, there's a lot that goes into that. And the respect factor of him founding a team overseas or not overseas um, in another country um, and then having the foresight to go into the champagne space. And then, yes, I might have convinced him to explore the cannabis space, but I also was interested in another business um, that we exited out of. And he had the forthright to see, hey, this space is more than CBD. It's more than THC, CBG, and the other cannabinoids. Um, what this really is about is the entire hemp plant returning and being able to not only, you know, help your mental health, 
but also, you know, really save CO2, save the climate, and also, you know, hopefully give us some new threads to wear. <laughs> right. I agree 100%. People don't understand how vast and how much depth it is to the cannabis industry. I would love, because you spoke on it a little bit, I actually came from a music background myself also, like, what were some of the similarities you see from like music and entertainment and cannabis? Um, because people don't realize that I always say the same person who was spending 20 or $30 at the CD store. Now they just have an app on their phone, but they still spend that money in cannabis at a dispensary or, or on CBD. So you're kind of marketing to the same person in a lot of instance, instances. Like what, what, if anything, did you learn from music that you've applied to cannabis? I've learned two things uh, from music that I've applied to cannabis. Um, the first thing being bias. Um, I found that a lot of people in the industry and a lot of people of color um, don't trust the other cannabinoids, CBD or CBG. Nah, I'm good. I'm not this <laughs> THC. Nah, I don't need that. That cream. Nah, I'm good. Um, so I found a lot of, a lot of bias in terms of people trying other things, you know, being in the, the studio, um, you get so used to your pattern, your creative pattern. And if you're really disciplined at it, um, you get great results. Um, Eminem is one of the people who is known for how diligent he is in his, uh, music, the way he comes in at nine and leaves at five. There are stories of, you know, artists showing up late and Eminem's leaving and he's like, well, you were late, I'll see you tomorrow. I work <laughs> nine to five. Uh, so the discipline factor, um, when cannabis, you know, can help you be creative, um, transfer you into the multi multiverse and stuff like that. But also, you know, cannabis can be a distraction. I know many artists who just kind of sit in the studio and just rack up that bill. So any artist watching this, I encourage you, you know, take the time to be creative, but also take the time to be disciplined. The second thing that I learned from uh, being in the music industry and applying it to cannabis is joy. Um, the joy that can come from discovering something that makes you feel better. There are multiple strains, multiple types of ways that you can use it, um, apply it, whatever. And everybody has a different way that works for them. If this strain doesn't work for you, you might be able to try this one and go so forth and so on. Um, I really think that the greatest thing is like when you, when you hear that song and you know you, you know you got that hook right and you know you got that burst right, when I see somebody who looks at me and says, wow, Josh or Zeke, as everybody <laughs> calls me, but Josh as my dad calls me and my mom will never call me Zeke. Um, <laughs> it's that joy that really comes over your face when you know that you help somebody, um, that you genuinely helped somebody um, feel better. You know, just plain and simple. Do you feel better? Right. That's amazing. And, and going back over to you, Isaiah, you are obviously one of the greatest basketball players in American history. And I always say that you would be even better today than you were in the 80s, um, because I think you're more of the pro prototypical guard that we see today. But coming from in the 80s, you saw kind of the relationship between professional sports and cannabis evolve, right? And to where now, as you know, the NBA and NFL have really relaxed their views on the plant. How do you feel like that has an effect on maybe athletes moving forward to maybe really be able to treat or heal themselves through cannabis or CBD as opposed to maybe some type of opioid or other alternative? It, the, the plant, uh, the healing factors and the, um, the, the information and education around the plant is, is, will be life-changing. Um, and the discovery of the endocannabinoid system that we all have uh, none of us knew that we had that inside our body um, and the way opioids were, were basically um, uh, being used uh, to treat the things that the plant actually works for within your body. 
Uh, so your CB1 and your CB2 receptors that works directly with the hemp plant, that works directly with the cannabis plant. It's almost as if this, this plant was created for your body. And uh, what we're finding in sport, and I think what uh, the medical industry is finding also, is that the more you use this plant, the more you discover about it, the more we learn about our endocannabinoid systems and our CB1, CB2 receptors, how they respond to the plant, the more education we get, the more information we get, uh, the better we'll be at self-healing, uh, the better we'll be at knowledge. Uh, the, the plant in terms of its, uh, the way it was, um, I guess, um, you know, uh, banned uh, from, from the American uh, use and, and the way the, the pharmaceutical industries and other industry more or less regulated against the plant uh, we see other industries popped up uh, and became, you know, big money makers uh, around the, the pseudo use of this plant. Uh, however, now that the plant is really coming back and people are finding out all the real benefits of it, uh, its impact in terms of what it's going to do in sport, what it's already done to the medical field, what it's continuing to do to the medical field. And as they say, knowledge is power. And the more knowledge the athlete gets about his body and the more it and the more he understands and she understands how it reacts with the plant i think the more use it will have exactly i think every athlete wants a an edge um an illegal edge at that um but i think it's also really interesting to me that you know the biggest players in terms of athletes um had pretty much career ending injuries. You know, my dad being one of them, he tore his Achilles and can barely move his wrist um, down. Al Harrington tore his ACL and I believe his uh, MCL as well. Mike Tyson, he's a boxer. He's probably got all kinds of, you know, injuries. Um, and um, Calvin, Calvin retired prematurely after, you know, taking a bunch of beatings. So you look at, you know, all these athletes who really had their bodies beat down at the prime of their career. It is fascinating how much longer their career probably could have gone had they had the knowledge and wisdom and, you know, been legally able to do it, been promoted by the doctors and the medical staff and society, et cetera, how much longer uh, they could have gone. I mean, you could have about four rings right now. Oh, way more than that. <laughs> <laughs> I say five. <laughs> way more than that. <laughs> no, I agree. I was actually watching an Al Harrington conversation where he stated like he's probably healthier for a ball player to after a game to take the edge off, maybe take an edible than to drink, you know, some type of hard alcohol, but they couldn't do that because the edible would have been illegal, right? So I, I concur 100% with that. And kind of moving into some, rec some recent news you guys had made about an investment in international cannabis, I would love for you guys to kind of go into what was your thinking around saying, hey, we're gonna look outside of just the United States market for opportunities in cannabis. Well, our firm is named Isaiah International, and, and it's, it's called International for a reason. Uh, we, uh, most of our business is, is outside of, of the U.S. borders, um, you know, whether it be in Canada, whether it be in Europe, uh, now Colombia. We do have businesses here in America, but we, we, we operate, um, you know, internationally. And looking at the, the, the cannabis space again, uh, the lessons learned in the champagne space uh, when we went into Champagne, we didn't realize that we were going into the agriculture and farming business. And as Joshua touched on, he talked about the, the indigenous growers and the farmers in Champagne. Once you develop the relationship with, with, the, with the growers and the farmers and you start understanding uh, the equatorial advantages that the land gives you, that the climate gives you, then you start understanding the crop that comes out of the, out of the soil and what makes it so unique and the juices that you can extract from that, from that crop that, that makes it so unique. So now you got a product that you can sell. Learning all that in the champagne space, uh, when I looked at, uh, when we looked at uh, Colombia 
and we talked about hemp and we talked about cannabis. Well, the best hemp and cannabis is grown in Colombia. Why? Because of the equatorial advantages, because of the soil, because of the climate, you get 12 hours of natural sun and, and the indigenous growers that we partnered with, very similar to what we did uh, in the champagne space. So One World Farmer, when you look at the success that we're having in One World Farmer right now on the cannabis side, and also the, the success that we're having with Chalon Champagne uh, in, in, in Europe and in France, they're very similar, just different crops, but really the same kind of business methodology that went into it. Uh, fortunately enough for us in, in the Columbia space and in the hemp and cannabis space, we're able to extract multitudes of products out of one seed, as opposed to just uh, you know a couple of things out of out of the grape. So uh, you know it's a it's a big opportunity. Uh, we see uh, right now we're uh, we're pioneering the space, uh, just like we're pioneering the uh, the champagne space as the the only owner importers of uh, champagne with the with the largest uh, owner importers of first press of the grape champagne in the world. And uh, we're proud of that. And now in the cannabis space, uh, operating in the Pan Americas, being able to uh, supply not only the Americas, but also being able to reach across the water and enter into uh, Europe and other different places uh, where we see the plant having profound impact and, and impact in every industry, whether it be the auto industry, whether it be a medical industry, whether it, be, whether it be the food and beverage industry, this plant will play in every industry. And we wanna be at One World Farmer, uh, the leaders and the suppliers to those who are looking to impact those industries. No, I love it. I'm rooting for you guys 100% because you know figures like yourself, Al Harrington, just people that you know our people respect and know are successful and have the intelligence. So you guys are in a lot of ways validating cannabis as a viable opportunity to the average person who's not follow, following the industry. And I think that's important because we we need more of us over here, right? We need more talented people. And I and that kind of segues to my next point. It's been a a, a, a trend that I've been seeing that I love, like you two uh, being in business together, obviously. Um, I just had a conversation with John Sally and his daughter who have a, they founded a cannabis company together. So we're seeing more like generational and family-based business from black people in cannabis, which I hope to see continue to grow. Can you kind of speak on Zeke, just being able to bring your family business into this in like such a cool and, and profitable way so early on in the industry? Well, what I would say is the thing that we have to always remember as people of color, as black culture, is that, you know, most of our wealth, the only opportunity that we had to make wealth was through sports and entertainment. Um, that was the only way out. Um, there weren't that many people who got the opportunity to be doctors and lawyers. Now we're seeing those opportunities um, reflected, uh, hopefully, in the country more and more. But being able to pass generational wealth, I'm proud to say, you know, my dad was able to get into the MBA and then navigate himself through the business um, perspective, but get that basketball platform to be able to do so. Without many people of our type having those platforms, I'm not sure how much, fur how, how much further we would be able to push um, this rock up the hill in terms of you calling us pioneers in the space. We definitely want to bring more like-minded people of color into the space 100%. Want to pave the way for people to see this as, you know, again, a medicine. Um, it's exciting to be in a family business. Stressful sometimes because you know your boss can used to give you spankings. But at the same time, it's beautiful because you get to pick not only your dad's brain, your mom's brain, sister and cousins, but we all are in it together and really committed. And it's not just, um, 
you know, everybody's got degrees, everybody's educated, everybody's have has very beautiful resumes, but we've all come together and said, hey, let's move together as a family. And during this COVID time and during uh, the civil rest uprising, um, nothing has been more important to me than family. So having the successes that we are having and will have um, will mean more to me than I think uh, my father knows. Oh man, that was smooth. <laughs> I like that answer. Um, yeah, wrapping up guys, I definitely don't wanna hold you too long. I would love for you guys to talk about just what are your outlook on 2021 because cannabis and hemp did so well in 2020. Um, what are some of the identi- opportunities you guys are identifying and what you wanna do moving forward? Um, I'll answer one and then I'll allow him to close out. Um, I want to say, yes, cannabis and hemp did very well in 2020, but also many small businesses closed and were impacted and sales slowed down, um, for many of those businesses. Um, yes, you know, you're seeing, um, billion dollar valuations for some companies, which, could be overvaluated, could be whatever. Um, but as this space begins to, you know, regulate or st- stabilize, um, you'll see, you know, who really did the work to stay in the business, to have the forthright to go forward and not just look at it as um, selling weed. Um, so I guess what I really, um, want to communicate to anybody who's trying to get into this space is realize that you're getting into a space to A, help people and B, um, to generate uh, income. But you have to start with helping people first. Agreed, 100%. I would, I would, I would close out and just say that the opportunity that I see uh, in this space is the, is, is hemp is, is the natural carbon sink. And when we talk about uh, hemp uh, and its usefulness in the world at large, uh, we, we're all dealing with climate change. We're all seeing the, uh, the planet go through its, um, its temperature changes. And the way to control that and the natural way to reduce your carbon footprints is through the use of hemp. And I see this plant again being applied in every space um, and not only being applied in every space, but reducing the carbon footprint across the world. So uh, I think that's the biggest impact that the plant will have um, while it will help us um, our, um, our physical. I think what it will do for the environment and what it will do for climate change, um, we haven't even scratched the surface of, of how this plant is going to impact every single industry. So when you look at every piece of plastic in the world, and you look at every piece of plastic that's in your house, imagine that plastic being made of hemp now. That's how impactful this plant will be. I agree 100%. And as uh, Zeke alluded to earlier, a lot of us don't know the history of hemp and how many products and, and, you know, how many variety of things were made from hemp prior to it being outlawed. So I think the public will come around to it in due time, but thank you guys so much. It's an honor to have a conversation with you guys. I can't wait to send this to my uncle. (laughs) (laughs) uh, I would love for you to uh, leave us with where we maybe can follow um, the company on social media. And if anyone wants to reach out to you guys directly, maybe on like LinkedIn, if they have any questions. Um, The Isaiah International Twitter is- um, It's Isaiah International Twitter. Uh, It's Isaiah. Isaiah underscore international uh, dot com and uh, One World Pharma is a uh, OWP, but you can also go to our website, Isaiah International, and uh, you can see all of uh, the companies that we're involved in um, and um, get some information. But And, and you, I'm just Isaiah Thomas on Instagram. And, and you can feel free to hit me on at Zeke underscore Thomas. I'm more likely to respond to the DMs than him. Of course. Stay out of the DM. Don't DM me. You're just talking to yourself in there. (laughs) You know, I I read.
read it and be like, hey. 